So I was wandering around out there in the uh, booths, and I, I came across something that I'd seen before. It, it, uh, it's something that I quoted on Your Voice, Your Vote yesterday, or whenever we did it, I guess a day or two ago. Do you know that Oregon has added 17 new state and local government jobs every single day for the last three years? You know, Oregon State added, added 40, four, plus 4,000 jobs in 2014, plus 5,000 jobs in 2015, and plus 6,000 jobs to the public payroll in 2016. If you do the math, it's 17 new jobs every single day in government. Where is the call for a hiring freeze at the state level? If you expect me to believe you have a $2 billion delta, Grandpa said it best, when you find yourself in a hole, quit digging. And this government can't quit digging. And here's the awful truth. This government is so corrupt, it's been running on bread and circuses for the last decade. And the circuses aren't hard to find. They're coming out of the Portland Progressive Agenda. You know, uh, crazy ballot initiatives, uh, you know, driving their base to the, to the vote. They want to register 16-year-olds. Can you believe that? They don't want those kids to vote. They just want to get them on a mailing list so that they can turn them into little droids, little demo bots that will hear from their peers what a great thing the socialist agenda looks like. And why not? When you're 16 or 17 years old, your heart is as big as Oregon. And you're not worried about who pays for it because dad pays for it or mom pays for it or Uncle Sam pays for it. So what about the bread? Well, the bread happens to be a feedback loop from the Oregon Public Employee Unions to the Democrat coffers, to the Democrat elections, to the Democrat tax votes, to the overspending that we have in Oregon. There's a connection here. It's a closed loop, and I'm mad as hell about it. And I don't want to take it anymore. And here's how you'll see it reflected in the Senate Republican agenda every single day. We got a thing called the bad bill list. I don't know, I've, I've mentioned it before in our chats, our annual chats. Uh, in the short session, the Democrats had 38 bills that they wanted to run. They were imperative to their agenda. We killed about uh, 30 of them. The eight that got through were horrible. Don't misunderstand me, but the 30 that we killed deserved a slow and painful death. We smothered those bad bills in their little cradles, and we're happy about it. <laughs> we're gonna get down and dirty sometimes. So I want you to understand that the legislative process today in that building is a clash between two Hollywood movies. Groundhog Day, because we wake up, you know, and we, and, we, and we seem to do the same thing. Every one of those bad bills that we've killed in the past is back again. Gun bills, uh, voter registration bills, loopholes here, spending there, you know, so, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very embarrassing to see those bills come back and back and back again. We wake up, you know, every every day trapped in the snow globe, which is Oregon, and the swirl, you know, the little the little snowflakes bring their their progressive agenda, uh, and the idea that this bread and circuses thing, the problem is they've run out of bread, they have run out of bread. Uh, do you believe for a second that there's a two billion dollar shortfall? No. No. But you know what? People's eyes glaze over when you start talking about the shortfall. I was in the uh, the look forward on the revenue projections that we get the day before the public gets it. And it's the only place I've ever been where somebody gave us $200 million more to spend and the predominant emotion in that room was disappointment. $200 million more and the predominant emotion was disappointment. Oregon has got the end of the Oregon Trail legislative Delta Blues. There is no shortfall. There's $1.4 billion in unanticipated revenue. It's brand new. We'll get to that. I got the end of the Oregon Trail Delta Blues from the top of my head right down to the soles of my shoes. Well, I'm out of hell and I'm not going to take it anywhere and neither should you. And the bread and circus is gravy train is open. 
We're still going to see the surfaces. If you want to watch the surfaces, they've moved out to your districts. It is the legislative revenue circus that they bust people in and talk about all of the needful services that Oregonians have to have or they'll just perish. And we see the same stories over and over and over again. The fact of the matter is, yes, we have to bend the cost curve because we've run out of money. We've just run out of money. Uh, we're going to continue to play whack-a-mole in, in the state legislature. We still have our bad bill list running. We're going to try and fill every one of those bad bills. But we're not apparently going to deal with the four issues that we need to be dealing with, which is how do you fund the transportation package without gouging people at the gas pump for things that don't fill potholes or don't build bridges or don't build roads. You know, that's the low carbon fuel standard. If we want to reduce carbon and Oregonians want us to, we can do that with our investments in transportation without a diversionary fee that takes money out of the road fund and puts it in to green energy projects like solar and wind and, and uh, battery development for uh, electric cars. Uh, let's true up that. If you know, we're going to get a transportation package, uh, I don't know how I can go to folks and ask them to support a transportation package when I don't know whether the low carbon fuel standard will cost them one cent a gallon, which is what the Democrats say, or 19 cents a gallon, which is what some of the legislative fiscal analysis shows us, or a dollar a gallon, which is what the California Truckers Association tells us it costs them now in California. So at the end of the day, are we going to have a transportation package? I don't know. It all depends on whether or not the Democrats will let go of this bread and circuses mentality and the shell game they're playing with low carbon fuel standard. What about PERS reform? You know, it's on the tip of everybody's tongue. And I want to just point out, is Senator Knope still in the room? Would you please stand up? I want to, you know, I want you guys to give this guy an ovation where he stands up. <laughs> Senator Knope reached out to Senator Johnson and the two of them started having meetings and actually the Republicans in the House and the Senate have forced the PERS issue to the top of the table. It is too big to ignore. How many of you believe there's a $23 billion shortfall in funding PERS? How many of you believe that? Sorry, you're wrong. You only get the $23 billion shortfall if you can assume a 7.5% rate of return on the stock market. It was 6.6. .6 last year, year before it was two. If we actually looked at a market rate of return and any private sector actuarial will tell you this, at the most generous we could be is 4%, we should really be at a 3.5 for planning. That makes the unfunded first mandate $72 billion. You don't even want to do the math. $72 billion divided by 4 million Oregonians equals bankruptcy for the state. So do we have to do a PERS reform? Yes. Is there something that we are proposing to do a PERS reform? Yes. The three things that the working group is proposing is, look, cap the final average salary to $100,000. Is that wrong? Most state employees will never get to $100,000. But a few of the folks who've got these stratospheric payouts from PERS, like coaches or physicians, uh, are bankrupting the system. You cap that at $100,000, you'll probably save about $3.3 .3 billion over the next 18 to 20 years. Uh, make sure PERS members contribute to PERS costs. Redirect that IAP 6% to reducing PERS costs, and you would save another $3.6 billion. Uh, and then finally, stop pension spiking, where people can use their accrued vacation, accrued sick leave, uh, work as much overtime as they possibly can for three years, build up those monthly payments at the end of their first career, and cash that all in at the end. That would only save $700 million. And our, if we fail to do those relatively easy, very likely legal, undoubtedly according to our legal opinions, constitutionally valid PERS reforms, 
What does that tell our actuarials and what does that tell the people that are rating Oregon's bonds? That we're irresponsible, that we're not fiduciaries, and that we won't accept responsibility for our approved management. And 